Today is very much championing people who I work with in the front line of conservation. It's an enormous privilege to be able to do that. And I want to introduce them to you and tell you a bit about the work that they do. Because I think sometimes it's quite difficult for us to conceive of how difficult that work is and how difficult the working arena is. We are typically, by, by, by default, armchair conservationists. You know, I constantly support the struggle to uh, get rid of the ivory trade, but I don't do that in Africa because I live in the UK. I do get off my arse and go out to look after hen harriers in the UK because that's my backyard. But we share these concerns about many species all across the world. But it's quite difficult for us to put our feet into the shoes of the people who are actually out there getting on with the work. And from my point of view, I love people who get on with the work. I'm running out of patience for people who sit around and talk about it year after year after year after year and nothing changes. I like proactive, uh, proactive, practical conservation in action. And that's what we're going to celebrate in the next 45 minutes. I have the enormous privilege of working with a woman who is one of the, the most dynamic and inventive and imaginative and diligent and energetic conservationists that I've ever met. She accompanies me, or I should say I accompany her, um, to Cyprus and Malta and in future on a great many other projects. I met her years ago over an argument about who should own a wax wings wing. And at that point, I was working on Autumn Watch, I think, and someone had very kindly sent in a dead wax wing. And I hate to say it, folks, but I'd rather like a dead wax wing because you can touch the waxy bits of its wing and figure out they're not actually waxy. And I'd never had a dead wax wing before, and the minute I saw it lying there wrapped in tissue paper, I thought, yippee, I've got myself some wax wings wings after all of these years. But oh no. Because between me and the Waxwing was the one and only Ruth PC. And she owns the Waxwing's wings. And that tells a story about who wears the trousers and their great trousers. Can I give you Ruth PC, please? Thank you, Chris. And um, I'd like to actually start by saying thank you um, on behalf of everybody in this room, on behalf of the organisations, the teams that we work with in the fields, and of course on behalf of the wildlife that you support. You always say, I'm an old punk rocker. You're not an old punk rocker, you're a punk rocker. You get up 15 minutes before anybody else I know, and thank God you do. Um, I get a lot of people that come to me and say, I really want to make a difference, but they always say, why? Why would you do that? Chris always says, why wouldn't I do that? And that's the attitude. But I'm... So thank you. I'd like to say thank you. I never get a chance to say thank you, so thank you. Um, that okay. still doesn't mean I'm going to get up and make you tea, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, I'm going to talk about why. So why do we go to Malta? Malta, for anyone who doesn't know, thank you. First of all, sorry, thank you to everybody here who has supported all of our campaigns. As you know, we've been going out to Malta and Cyprus for the last few years since 2014, running various video campaigns to try and bring awareness of the issue. For those who don't know, the issue is this. Malta is a tiny island that lies in the heart of the Mediterranean. It's directly between Africa and Italy. This makes it the perfect spot for migrating birds. And in springtime, they fly over in their millions. Um, these birds are the successful breeders. They're the birds that have survived not only at least one migration, they've also survived a winter in a hard Africa climate. They've found enough food and they're heading back to Europe to breed. <coughs> Unfortunately, as they pass over, they're passing over this island, which is the only place in Europe that's got a derogation to, the EC birds, to an area of the EC Birds Directive, which means that it is legal to get out and hunt these breeding birds. So right across Europe, you can't hunt birds in spring that are migrating back. But in Malta, they, until very recently, allowed the hunting of turtle doves, and they still allow the, the hunting of quail during springtime. That's bad enough, because science is showing that these birds are on the decline. But on top of that, once the hunters are out, they get very trigger happy. They don't just shoot what they're allowed to shoot, which, you know, let's talk about that another time. Um, they shoot everything, and I mean they're taking down 
Harriers, Marsh Harriers, Montagues Harriers, Bee Eaters, Cuckoos, all the birds that you and I go miles and miles to try and see, and we relish and we enjoy, and we just really, really appreciate. These guys are just blasting out of the sky. And um, when we were out there this year in, in April, we saw and we met up with one of the unfortunate victims um, that had been shot and was being looked after by BirdLife Malta. So if we could have the first clip, please, we can show Chris meeting that bird. This is a little female kestrel that was illegally shot during the shooting season here, picked up by a member of the public. One of 15 birds that were recovered during that period. Now, due to the trespass laws here in Malta, you can't just wander into a field to pick up a bird that's, you know, dead or dying. So these 15 birds are tip of an iceberg, and everyone knows that. Now, whether there are tens, hundreds, or thousands more of these birds which are being shot, and we can't recover them, we can't find them, we don't know. But all we know is that 15 is not a representative number. But it is an indication that despite everything they say, illegal shooting still persists here and it's still a serious problem. This is common kestrel. Other birds that were shot include hoopoo and marsh harriers too. Fortunately, this little bird has been shot in one of its wings and in the particular site of the injury, there were two bones and only one of which is... I think there's a good chance that it might be able to fly again and therefore be released. So bird life are doing a great job of looking after it. The vet's still tending it to make sure it's okay. And the plan is, if it recovers its strength and it can fly again, it will probably be taken to Camino, an island where there's no shooting, and released. And it might, you know, carry on its migration, or it might try and stay and breed in Malta. But if it does, it's going to be lucky, because here in Malta, despite the enormous abundance of prey for these birds, there are only two breeding pairs of kestrel. Two breeding pairs of kestrel in the whole of Malta. And that alone is, is an obvious indictment of the pressure that these animals are under through illegal killing. Two pairs of kestrel. It's ridiculous. It's pitiful. It's laughable. What do you say, really? You've got two breeding pairs of kestrel. Uh, the, the, the bird life of Malta should be phenomenal. It should be a place where there are stands out here offering bird tours. Because when you go to Camino, this tiny island where there is no shooting, Occasionally, boats rock up with some lunatics on it and they kill a few things. But in the main, there's no shooting. It is a fabulous place for birding. Golden orioles, all sorts of other species that are there on migration, plenty of habitat, birds that are easy to find, you get close views, it really is an amazing place to be. Morsa is missing a trick. It should be an eco-tourist hotspot in the Mediterranean. We, you, I, we should all be flocking there in springtime to fill our boots with brilliant, uh, brilliant birding experiences. You know, so effectively this hunting is costing them an enormous amount of money. Tourism in Malta is basically about summer tourism, it's about beach tourism at the moment. But if they were to explo exploit what we call the shoulder peak seasons, i.e. that going in and out of their main season, that would tie in perfectly with spring migration and autumn migration. And we would go there and fill those hotels and communicate with the locals and contribute to their economy and bring this country, when it comes to conservation and the environment, into the 21st century. Because at the moment, it's in the Middle Ages. There is no doubt about that. And Ruth, I mean, I remember going there for the first time. Ruth had been a couple of times before me. You can't get your head around the fact that when you go birding there, you go birding to watch birds being killed. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you're in the field, and I love, I love turtle doves. I love them. I drive all the way from Bristol to Norfolk to get a fix of a turtle dove every spring. So to go to Malta and watch these beautiful birds, and I, Chris is right. These are the best views of these birds that you can see anywhere. They're flying so low over your head. It's phenomenal. And then you hear bang, 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 bang. And then you watch these birds fall out of the sky. It's horrific. It's bad enough with turtle doves. It's bad enough with the birds that you think, OK, you're kind of preparing yourself to see being shot. 
But imagine seeing a Montague's Harrier. Imagine a beautiful male's Montague's Harrier. This is a bird that you know you dream about, that you really you you just wake up in the morning if you think you're gonna see a Montague's Harrier, oh my gosh, it's gonna be the best day of your life. Imagine seeing that being shot out of the sky. And I mean we go there, we know this is what we're expecting. There are people out there who live with this, who are facing this every single day, and they're still getting up, and they're still getting out there, and they're still fighting. And to be honest, that's incredible, because it's really, it's really, really, really hard. It's really hard to watch birds that you love just being blasted. I, I urge you to, to, to visit the Bird Life Mortar stand. There's a young man working there, and when I first met him, we were talking about, you know, how do you get into birding on Malta when every time you go out, you see the birds being shot? And he said, well, it was just the way I grew up. The first peregrine falcon I saw, I saw dying because it was shot. The first black stork that I saw, I saw it dying because it had just been shot. Imagine you start your bird list with birds that you see getting shot out of the sky. This is an enormously tough working environment. And as Ruth says, these people get up and they battle on and they really need our support. So I would like you to offer some of that support now to Mark Sultana, who is the CEO of BirdLife Malta. Um, can you tell us a bit about what the current situation is in Malta this year, please? Yes, um, the current situation is the same situation we've had for a number of years, which is practically you have hunters with guns in the countryside in spring and in autumn, who the only thing that stops them from shooting an illegal, uh, a protected bird is either the knowledge of that they can be caught, our presence in the field, and possibly maybe if we're lucky, some police because the mentality has not yet changed to understand the conservation value of not shooting a protected bird. So at the moment, this is a psychological situation. The moment they think they can get away with it, they will get away with it. So this is why we have to put a lot of resources from Bird Life Malta, the limited ones we have, and try to get as many other volunteers from abroad to go in the countryside during this time so that the hunters would not feel comfortable shooting a protected bird. Last year was the worst year in spring for pro protected birds being shot in the past five years. And it's true, 15 is just you know, the tip of the iceberg. But when you compare it with the previous year, which was 10, and then the even year before, which was six, it just shows you there's another trend going on that they feel it. And it's all about enforcement. And that's despite the fact that this year they couldn't hunt turtle doves? Yes, this year they couldn't hunt turtle doves. Now, with turtle doves, um, we are convinced that turtle doves have been shot this year. Um, however, just because there was this moratorium and there was this uneasiness that if you're caught, you might be prosecuted, and we were in the field for that purpose, we managed to see turtle doves that we've never seen before. We've had turtle doves who we tagged, and I, we are in Marquee 7, and uh, if you want to come over, we'll show you exactly how we are tagging turtle doves with these satellite tags, and you can actually follow them all the way. They go down to Nigeria, all the way back to Italy, Croatia, Slovenia. And these birds were staying in Gozo and in other, in other areas for a whole week before they continue their migration. They never used to do that because they used to either be shot or as, you know, uh, dispersed and, and they have to fly on. So th it's just frustrating to understand that if there was no hunting in Malta, in particular in spring, I think it would be a, a, a haven for, for birds and for migratory birds. So. But of course, it's not just shooting, is it? In the, since we've been going out there, we've seen an increase in the number of birds in cages and the yes. number of birds being trapped, finch trapping. Finch trapping, by the way, is completely illegal all across the EU, including, well, sort of, in Malta. Yes, uh, finch trapping uh, in Malta is, uh, is not just uh, devastating for the finches itself, but it's also devastating for the habitats. Because what they do is they clear patches of land, they put nets which are flat on the ground, and then they pull a, a system, a mechanical system, where the claps fold over each other. They're called clap nets. It's non-selective, so you would catch the birds that you intend to, bear, to catch, but also other birds which are uh, with them. But it's against the law. The methodology is against the law in the EU, not in Malta. The, 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 the finch, finches are protected in the EU, but not in Malta. And therefore, there was this derogation, and we have pushed a lot to the Commission, the EU Commission, to take action, and they have taken action. They have taken Malta to court. 
we have just received uh, news from the Attorney General, uh, which is a, like a documented opinion, saying that Malta was wrong in opening that season. So now we're hoping that before October, when the season starts, the verdict comes out, stops this uh, atrocity, and then it would be our job again to be in the fields to make sure that uh, it's not just the law, but it's that the obedience of law. <laughs> so. Yeah. Fantastic. So if you want to find out more about the work that BirdLife Malta is doing in a new campaign that they've got coming out, then please do go to Marky Mark Mark 7 and catch up just, with Mark. Just across. And We've got yeah. most of the team here who do the most of the work in the field are there. And um, they'll be also outside. So if you need to ask any questions on your directions, they will let you know. And, and do come over and do, do help and speak to us. And, and if you have any questions, we'd be very, very happy to answer. Do, do go and speak to them. Thank you very much, Thank Mark. You. Let's hear it. Bird Life Malta. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've, as I say, we've been going out there since 2014. We've actually got a film that's going to summarise all of our work and, and, well, not just our work, but the work that Bird Life Malta are doing and kind of our experiences since 2014. We're doing a, so a whole film showing how the situation in Malta has changed over the last four, four times that we've visited. That film's going to be launched at the Lush Film Festival on the 5th of September. And here's a clip that we've got which will show one of the many bizarre situations that Chris has found himself in whilst trying to fight for birds in Malta. Next clip, please. I just spent the last two hours in this police station in Gozo after we were instructed to come back here by the police because two trappers who uh, were present at the time claimed that I'd assaulted them. And so now on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock I have to come back to Gozo where I've been charged with using force against any person with an intent to insult, annoy or hurt them and also uh, for having at the same time pushed against any person with the object of hurting or insulting that person. Needless to say, and I'm sure I don't have to explain, um, I'm completely innocent of these charges. Not only was I the victim of being pushed and jostled around, I was also then pushed all the way up the street by a policeman. Malta. I wonder what the courts would be like. The court was one of the most exciting and greatest days of my life. I was standing in the dock, accused of these crimes. The man who'd accused me wasn't in the courthouse, nor was the policeman who'd brought the charges. They were both curiously absent. And then, at a certain point, the judge called for evidence, and my erstwhile colleague, Ruth, came in brandishing a CD. The courthouse was filled full of hunters. It was packed to the rafters, and they were hoping to see us shamed and embarrassed and fined and jailed and beaten and flogged and stopped and hung and disemboweled and guillotined. <laughs> As the CD came in, they just turned white <laughs> and left in their droves. So watch the film. It will be out on YouTube on the 5th of September. And also, BirdLife Malta will be running a new fundraising campaign. Please give generously. Now, we had been going to Malta for a few years, um, and then BirdLife produced their report showing that 22 million birds were being killed every year in the Mediterranean basin, largest numbers in Italy and also in Egypt too. And whilst we're still members of the European Union, we've decided to focus our efforts on countries which are uh, members of that union where we can better exert pressure, not just in that country, but through the European Commission too. So we decided that we had uh, three days off, and there's no excuse for a day off. Um, so we gave up those three days, and we went off to Cyprus, which uh, is another country, obviously a member of the EU, and therefore we decided to investigate what was going on there. I think we've got a short film, Ruth? Yeah, we've got first uh, the clip for Cyprus, please. Do you see it? Well, here we are, making a getaway through the bushes because a pick-up with some trappers or shooters has arrived. And uh, we just don't want them to know we've been active in this area. 
these guys are uh, a bit more hardcore than the people we've been mixing with in Malta. We're going to sneak in in the dark and hopefully see if we can find some nets and other trapping paraphernalia. On Cyprus, the problem's a little bit different to in Malta. In Cyprus, there's less shooting and more trapping, as you've seen there. Um, they use two methods, a traditional method, a lime stick, a stick about this long, covered in a sticky glue they place in trees. And, um, they place in trees around um, olive groves and things, and the birds come in and they get stuck to them and they get trapped, and it's horrific. They also have these huge rides of nets, which catch maybe 100 birds a night. And the most concentrated area, uh, sorry, the most concentrated time when this trapping takes place is in autumn, when they're targeting black caps um, for a dish called Ambelopulia. The birds are eaten. They're eaten, as I say, in this traditional dish. They're eaten whole. They, di they serve them up in a plate of 12. Co often cover them with a bed of salad because they're ashamed of what they're doing. It's completely illegal. And um, unfortunately, because they're using nets and lime sticks, it's an indiscriminate way of killing birds. So it's not just black caps and other warblers that get killed. Again, you're looking at orioles, bee-eaters, the kind of birds that you and I absolutely love. And don't get me wrong, I love a black cap too, but you're kind of, again, you're expecting that, but it's, it's the birds beyond that. And the key thing here is actually, it's not that it's, what's happening on Cyprus is terrible, but the, the main place, the largest area where the highest density of traps is occurring is on British sovereign soil. Last autumn, an estimated 800,000 birds, that's nearly a million birds, were killed on the sovereign base area. Okay, so the biggest problem for this is enforcement. Okay, it's just not being dealt with. And I understand that there might be three members of the sovereign base area police here today. So I'd like to say hello if you're in the audience. Fantastic, thanks for coming along do something about it and feel free <laughs> to film any of this talk because 800,000 birds is too many. <laughs> 15,000, between 10 and 15,000 birds a night. That's the estimate that BirdLife Cyprus came up with, the number of birds being killed on this British base. Can you imagine, close your eyes, just for a moment, close your eyes and imagine 15,000 black caps in this room now. 15,000. We'd be choking, we'd be suffocating on birds. And they leave this British base every morning dead in buckets throughout the autumn. That's not a pleasant place to work, that's a tough place to work. And we've celebrated Bird Life Malta and now I want to introduce you to one man who represents an extraordinary team from the Committee Against Bird Slaughter. Now, they're ostensibly based in Germany, but when you meet people who volunteer for the Committee Against Bird Slaughter, you meet people from all over the world. I was chatting to one young man in Cyprus who'd come all the way from Hong Kong. He worked for WWF. He was using up his holiday to fly from Hong Kong to Cyprus to go out with these people and work in the field and try and combat this issue. They, again, are a remarkable bunch of highly motivated volunteers who deserve enormous respect. And when Ruth and I make our films, it's not about us. We're not the heroes here at all. We go to celebrate these heroes and widen their awareness, the awareness of the work that they do by showing it to you. So once again, can you please put your hands together for Andreas from Committee Against Bird Slaughter. <laughs> And 
Jaya, thank you. Um, can you maybe explain to the audience exactly what cabs do out in Cyprus? Yeah, well, we, we make bird protection camps, which means when we, we are there during the peak trapping season for possibly the whole season, um, in autumn, winter, and in spring, and uh, with our volunteers, we try to stop uh, bird trapping, which means, uh, according to the season, we are out basically from 11 o'clock in the evening at, up to 10 o'clock in the morning when the trapping takes place, so night and morning. And uh, we detect the trapping sites, which is easy because now, after like uh, it's, uh, 10 years of campaign, mm -hmm. we, we have a database with 1,200 trapping sites exactly recorded with the whole story for each trapping site, how many birds, how many traps we have found in the past, enforcement, not enforcement, etc., etc. So we visited them in the night by but car or by foot. And, and what does that involve? What's, what's it like being a volunteer out there? Well, <laughs> It's, it's a sort of a hell, actually. So you, oh, you leave for Cyprus and you don't know if you come back sometimes because we had lots of accidents down there. Um, we, we find the, the trap inside and there either we dismantle the traps if we have no other choices or we try to, to call the police, the local enforcement agents, to, to set an ambush and possibly prosecute the, the, the trapper, which has a long last, longer lasting effect on, on the trapping uh, phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, if the law enforcement not coming, we, we have to dismantle the trap inside ourselves. So, we already know actually, according to the area, if there will be enforcement or not. And sometimes, according to the campaign or the options we have, uh, we are forced to, to collect the, trap, uh, the traps ourselves and uh, destroy them. And release any birds. And of course, this <laughs> goes without saying, yes. Yeah. Uh, we had an operation in, in winter to show the lack of enforcement during the winter season when uh, black caps, uh, sorry, um, black birds and thrushes and uh, robins and chaffinches are, are caught in the nets. And uh, we, we arrived to the island, Ruth was with us, and we found in two nights, like basically in 10 hours of work, of work, because we had to walk through the islands not to be spotted by trappers, we found 270 nets easily all around, close to the, to the houses, uh, by the roads. And it's very easy to detect them because every trapping site is, um, is, uh, is um, equipped with a uh, tape lure which is calling like the, like the call of the song thrush, and uh, you can uh, hear it from one kilometer away, from like more than one kilometer, sometimes one mile away. So it, basically you stop the engine of the car and you have all around you tape lures telling this is trapping, the other one is trapping, the other one is trapping. Then you get there and you have these huge nets, sometimes the tree which is uh, luring the, 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 the bird is one meter high, one meter, two meters high, and the net is six meters high. So <laughs> you can see them from, from the far away and pull off birds, as you've seen. It's, it really is. It's, it's ear-piercingly painful, and it's just devastating to see these birds. So how dangerous is it for your, for your volunteers? Well, it is dangerous. Obviously, not all trappers are, are criminals, but there are three mafia groups in Cyprus running this, this business, and they are ready to, to protect this business with, with weapons and with violence. So we had a couple of blue eyes, uh, bruises, I had my ear membrane torn by a punch, and, and, but basically those who pay the bill are the cars. So we had to change some 10 cars so far. And the last accident happened in, the, in January in the British sovereign base area. We were showing the police a trap inside, managed by one of the mafia gangsters, and suddenly when we were there with the, uh, our car and the, the police car, the car came out of the blue and started uh, ramming our car, destroyed it completely. And without the police intervening, basically they, they told us follow us in the police station, but uh, with the other car, the mafia car, trying to cut the road, etc., etc. And this is uh, well, uh, was really dangerous for us because we're talking about really mafia. And the police are just standing there doing nothing. Um, thank you. I highly, highly recommend that if you get a chance, you go to Marquee One Stand 38. Yep and catch up with these guys and hear more about their work and listen to more of their stories because they've got plenty. And please, please, please ask them how you can get involved, either by volunteering or donating to their work because it really, really is worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, the Committee Against Bird Slaughter. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.
We should say that the committee don't only work in Cyprus, of course. We work with them very closely in Malta. They work throughout France and Italy and other parts of Europe too, where they are highly effective. They are scoring successes. There are parts of Italy where they have turned hunters into bird watchers. People who were previously slaughtering uh, raptors on a migration point now, it's become a tourist hotspot, and the people who were previously there with their guns are now the ones pointing out the migrating birds. In France, they've pretty much done away with the Ortolan bunting trapping in southwestern France, and that's due to the pressure of these people working in very difficult environments. And they suffer physical abuse, as you've heard. But working in the field of conservation, these days, we don't only suffer physical abuse, we get constant mental abuse, and we get that through our social media. And one of the criticisms that we faced on the ground when Ruth and I have been working in Malta and in Cyprus from the hunters there is, hold on a moment, who are you to come over here and tell us what not to do with our birds? What are you doing about the birds in your country? What are you doing, they frequently say, about all of those hen harriers which are being illegally shot in your country? Why don't you off home and sort that problem out? And frankly, folks, they've got a point. Because there is bird crime happening in the UK. Our hands are not clear. In fact, our hands are covered in blood. And I want to introduce you now to an extraordinary woman a woman who's faced a torrent of mental abuse via social media, but has never dulled her energies when it comes to widening the awareness of these crimes. And she does it in a calm, deliberate, calculated, accurate, truthful, representational manner. I am in total awe of her endeavours and how much she has achieved when it comes to combating raptor crime in the UK. She runs Raptor Persecution UK, the blog that I'm sure that many of you have read, and tweets the same. She is the one and only Ruth Tingay. Let's hear it. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, and it wasn't exaggerated, Ruth. <laughs> Don't try and shirk from it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity uh, to, to talk. Um, I'm just going to start. Uh, with, we're talking about a project that we're, we're launching today, officially today. Uh, I just want to give you some background to that project. Um, so... Golden Eagles are uh, illegally killed in Scotland. I'm sure many of you are well aware of that. Uh, this is the bird uh, that actually got me interested in this whole issue. This is um, an adult female Golden Eagle who was breeding in the border. She was the only, uh, the last remaining pair of um, Golden Eagles breeding in the borders. She'd been there for 10 years. She, she'd hatched in Kielder Forest and she'd moved up to the borders, set up a territory, um, was quite happily breeding there. The landowner there was fantastic, protected these eagles. Um, in 2007, this bird was found poisoned. Um, and it particularly hit home to me because this was a, a site that I was monitoring. It was in my patch, um, and, and I was pretty shocked by, uh, by that, as, as you would. Lots of golden eagles are illegally killed in Scotland. Here's another one. This one was poisoned in the Cairngorms National Park. 2006, this one. Nobody was prosecuted for killing this, uh, as with the Borders golden eagle. We know, we know it was illegally killed. We know they were poisoned, uh, but no one has been prosecuted or convicted. Here's another one. Uh, this is a golden eagle called Alma with Roy Dennis there. Uh, Roy Dennis started satellite tagging golden eagles uh, in the late 2000s. He kind of pioneered the, the project. Uh, this golden eagle called Alma, he'd satellite tagged as a chick in the nest in the Cairngorms National Park. Uh, less than two years later, she was found dead on a grouse moor in the Angus Glens, uh, just outside the National Park. Again, she'd been poisoned. No one's been prosecuted for killing this bird. Here's another one. Uh, this was one of three golden eagles that was found poisoned on a huge estate called the Skibo Estate, further north in Scotland. Um, 
This one, again, had been poisoned. Um, it had fallen out of the tree uh, and was hanging by its foot. You can see a police officer there going in to, to retrieve it. Um, somebody was prosecuted on this estate, um, not for actually poisoning these three golden eagles. Uh, he was prosecuted and convicted because when they raided the estate, they found a big stash, like a massive stash of illegal poison. It was the same poison that killed these three eagles. Um, but unfortunately, they weren't allowed to prosecute him for poisoning the eagles because they couldn't prove that he was the one who'd put the poison out that killed these eagles. So they prosecuted him for possession of, of the pesticide instead. So another golden eagle, uh, no one's been prosecuted. Here's another one. Uh, this one was uh, from the Dumfries and Galloway pair. Um, it's the only pair breeding down there for a long time. This is the adult male from that pair. It was found shot on another grouse moor um, in 2012. It was picked up alive, barely alive. Um, it went through surgery. It survived for a couple of months, but then succumbed to its injuries. Again, no one's been prosecuted. This, is the, uh, this map shows you the conservation status of the golden eagle in Scotland. Uh, so this green area, uh, in this area, golden eagles are doing really, really well. They're in favourable conservation status. Uh, they're packed in, in, in this area. It's, it's a really good area. No grab smalls in, in this area, surprisingly. Um, this amber section, this is where golden eagles are not in cons uh, favourable conservation status, but they almost are. There are several tests that have to be met to, to, to make favourable conservation status, and they're almost, almost there. The red area, uh, guess what sort of uh, activity happens there? This is, uh, this is a huge area uh, that's kind of given over to driven grouse shooting. And in these areas, uh, golden eagles are not in favourable conservation status and haven't been for some time. I don't know if you can see that, uh, it's a bit of a, bit of a bad colour to choose, but um, overlaying the red there, I've got some purple dots. Uh, those are persecution data, raptor persecution data for uh, the last 15 years. Uh, and yeah, surprise, surprise, most of them are bunched in, this, uh, in these red areas. The reason people are killing golden eagles in Scotland is because uh, they like to eat red grouse. You can see on this, I've uh, got two fairly well-grown chicks here and uh, quite a lot of red grouse on the nest. The people who are producing these red grouse uh, are producing them to be shot uh, for sport or for, for fun. And um, it's, not, it's not on all red grouse moors where golden eagles are shot, but particularly, the problem is particularly on these intensively managed driven grouse moors where um, the idea is to get as many red grouse as you can uh, and shoot them. So very artificially high numbers of red grouse. This is a, a, a pretty good example of uh, what a, an intensively managed driven grouse moor looks like. Uh, you can see all this strip burning here, it's very characteristic, uh, no trees, um, pretty much a uh, few raptors too. <coughs> As I said, not all grass moors are, uh, are killing birds of prey. Um, it's just some of them. Um, we've been doing this project where we're mapping some of the estates around Scotland, some of the estates that we're particularly interested in uh, where intensive grass moor management uh, takes place. And I've started uh, with this. This map is not finished yet, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, this is the Cairngorms National Park, uh, and these are estate boundaries. Um, the estates in red are uh, defined by me as uh, intensively managed grass moor areas. The amber estates, uh, not, not so much, and the green estates uh, are not intensively managed at all. Here's another map. Uh, this is from some research that's just been done uh, looking at the tagging data. Um, over the last 12 years, uh, 141 golden eagles have been satellite tagged in Scotland and been tracked and monitored for scientific purposes. Uh, there was a review done just a couple of months ago looking, uh, looking for suspicious patterns of where some of these satellite tagged eagles disappear uh, without trace. Uh, and if you look on this map, uh, you can see this, they're, they're spread ar around, around Scotland, but there are some specific clusters. 
here, particularly around the Cairngorms National Park. Just bear that in mind for a second. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this guy. This is a guy called Ewan Weston who did his PhD on, uh, on looking at the juvenile dispersal of golden eagles in Scotland. He satellite tagged a load of golden eagles, uh, tracked them to try and work out where they were going, how they were using the land once they left their territories. Uh, and he came up with this, um, this idea of uh, these yellow blocks are what he calls um, temporary settlement areas. These are areas where young golden eagles go to gather. It's, it's a bit like a nursery area. Uh, and a lot of these tagged eagles that he was monitoring would spend time in these particular areas. The reason they were going to these areas in particular was because there were very few adult golden eagles holding territory, so the young birds wouldn't get uh, pushed away. What's really interesting, when you look at these temporary settlement areas and then overlay the data from the missing satellite tagged uh, golden eagles, look how many of those clusters are around those areas. And these are the areas where uh, intensive driven grouse wall management takes place. So we've got a, a project uh, that we're going to talk about, and I think I'm going to uh, hand it over to you, Chris. Yeah. The point is, we have this extraordinary technology which is becoming increasingly available. The cost of these transmitters is going down and down. As you know, they're getting smaller and smaller, and consequently, we can learn more about birds more quickly than ever before. There's no ambiguity. If you're satellite tracking a bird, you know where it is, plus or minus a few meters every day or whenever it transmits that signal. So these are a great tool for understanding the ecology of the birds. As Ewan has discovered, they move to these areas where there are no adult birds because basically they can relax there, they're not going to get chased out, they can feed, they can find their feathers, they can grow to maturity if they are not shot or poisoned. So that's a good bit of science. But they're also a tool when it comes to catching criminals because as we see, this data is able, uh, uh, enables us to highlight the areas where the persecution is taking place. So this year, I'm very pleased to say, to announce here for the first time, that uh, a very generous philanthropist who regularly supports this sort of work has given us some money to fit satellite tags onto golden eagles and other birds so that we can track them and see what happens to them in terms of persecution. So yes, of course we're interested in the science. All of that data will be made available to people who are studying these birds. The science is important. The more we learn, the better we can conserve. But so far, if we have the next slide, you can see these tags going onto these birds. In fact, here we are, it's a happy young eaglet wearing its satellite tag, and these uh, tags will last a number of years uh, without uh, us having to recapture, re-battery or anything so forth. They're solar powered. Let's have the next one. This is the slide that I really like, because I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, all of you good bird watchers in here, and all of you gamekeepers on the Angus Estates, that we have satellite tagged this year a shed load of eagles. <laughs> we know exactly where they are. And if they get killed, we will know exactly where they get killed. Now, we will go through the proper protocols. What we do is peaceful and democratic and fair and truthful. We do not ever need to transgress those objectives. So when one of our birds goes down under suspicious circumstances, we will immediately contact the police. If we recover the bird's body, it will go for post-mortem. After all, we need to prove, of course, that it didn't die an accidental death, which is always a possibility. We have to say that. And we will be working in conjunction with other NGOs, notably the RSPB. However, when it comes to actually releasing the information about where this bird has mysteriously disappeared or has been picked up poisoned or has died of old age or otherwise by accident, there will not be a time lag. There won't be a lag of months or years whilst this you know, is swallowed by courts and hidden from public view because as soon as we can definitely say there has been mischief, we will say there has been mischief and we will tell you exactly where it has occurred. Exactly where it's occurred. <laughs> Ruth and her partners have been working very hard in the field this year. The project will roll out next year. 
Uh, Birders Against Wildlife Crime have a very similar project running here in the UK. This is a new tool that we're using to combat illegal bird persecution. And our plan is, if it works well this year, we will roll it out again next year. And our philanthropist, I hope, uh, will give us some more money and we will tag even more birds. In the end, I sincerely hope that we will have a significant part of this bird's population, the Golden Eagle, plus goshawks, plus hen harriers, carrying satellite tags. We will know them all as individuals. They will be our friends. They will have names. And when we lose them, we will persecute those who persecute those birds. And eventually, we'll get prosecutions. We're never going to give up. We're never going to go away. We're never going to deviate from the methods that we use at the moment, which is good science and evidence, because we don't need to. And ultimately, for that reason, we will win. Now, I need you to do something just before we wrap up now. Would you please get your mobile phones out? I know people don't normally do this during a talk. Put them onto camera, because I think we've got a slide here, which I just want to call up. Can we have that last slide with the, uh, with the uh, yeah, here we are. Oh, it's a bit small. <laughs> OK, you're going to have to zoom in. OK, so basically, there are some Twitter addresses here. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see for Cyprus, Divisional Commander of British Forces Cyprus. Here it is, at BF Cyprus. And then we've got Defence HQ, Michael Fallon. He's the Secretary of State. He's the Ministry at the Ministry of Defence. It's under his watch that 15,000 black caps and other birds are dying on Cyprus every night on British soil in autumn. At Defence Capitals HQ, please tweet this man. It, we've elected him, some of us, some of you, have elected him. <laughs> we now need him to do his job, and we don't want these birds being killed. For Malta, Clint Camilleri. Clint Camilleri is the Wild Birds Regulation Unit in Malta. Clint underscore Camilleri. OK, find him on Twitter and tweet him. Do we want birds being shot in spring as they migrate back to breed in Europe? No, we don't. Do we want illegal bird killing in Malta in the 21st century? No, we don't. Tell Joseph Muscat underscore JM. He is the Prime Minister of Malta. You've got a direct line to the man who makes decisions there. He's a politician. He is therefore, by definition, interested in public opinion. It's what's got him into that position. Give him your opinion, please. Politely, very politely. Never insult these people. You don't need to insult them. They're insulting themselves by killing these birds. Just point that out, politely. And I would like to do one last thing. I can't give this presentation, and I know that we're probably running over by three minutes, but without calling onto the stage, a man who I consider to be one of the greatest living conservationists in the UK, a man who stands up and sticks his neck out and has set up, inaugurated, championed and campaigned on many different things, but you'll know him for the work that he does with hen harriers. Please welcome Mr Mark Avery. True to form, Mark, we're running out of time. Um, but tell us how we're winning, because we are winning in this argument, aren't we? Uh, we are winning. I mean, look at this room. It's got a 1,000 people in it. That's an army to start with. But you can tell that we're winning, not because everything has got better, because it's still bad, so we still need to keep going. But if you look at the people who are responsible for wildlife crime in this country, they are really rattled. They are getting nastier and nastier. They are running out of any decent arguments at all, so they just have a go at this guy. They just attack the people who stand up for wildlife. And it's so good to see so many people here. And, and I do think things are moving. With politicians, things are moving. I've heard a few things at the bird fair yesterday and today that you know, things are moving a little bit, a little bit. And in Scotland, there is the chance of getting licensing of shooting estates. We're not there yet, but fingers crossed it will happen. Down here in England, we're a bit behind the times, 
But if it happens in Scotland, it will happen here. And we are shifting the debate. Look at the media coverage on the inglorious 12th last weekend. Compare what was in the papers, on the telly, and on the radio last weekend with what it would have looked like three years ago. That difference in the debate where people are saying, some people want to ban this because of all these things. That's down to people like you, people like Ruth, and people like Chris. So we will win. Hold on, hold on. Andreas, Mark, come back on the stage. Ruth, come on. We have to go. Can I ask you to put your hands together? It'll be upstanding. <laughs>